ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to Reimagining Tech in 2022, presented by Google Cloud and EDCIO. We appreciate you all being a part of this innovative series of workshops around cutting edge technologies by seasoned technology leaders and Google Cloud experts. The sessions have been conceptualized, keeping in mind IT leaders who are looking to gain actionable insights to support their organization's digital growth strategies. Our today's workshop is focused on unlocking big data and reimagining business through smart analytics. Digital transformation propels businesses and industries forward, organizations of all sizes, from startups to global enterprises. Choose digital transformation not only to make scaled improvement, but also to drive significant change and fully embrace the digital age. To help IT decision makers in digital transformation, ET and Google Cloud have come up with an innovative series of workshops which will be conducted in the course of next few months. Leading experts will discuss what's next in each of the technology areas, their impact on business, and the roadmap to develop future strategies leveraging them. Now, without wasting much time, let us come back to our topic, Reimagining Tech in 2022, Unlocking Big Data and Reimagining Business Through Smart Analytics. I would welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Sunil Seni, Head Data Science at Bharat Pay. He is a data professional with 13 plus years of experience and demonstrated history of devising and implementing a scalable data strategy for enterprises and startups. He has conceptualized and implemented intelligence driven solutions across banking, telecom, insurance companies and fintechs in Southeast Asia. I request you to kindly deliver the address. We will also have a Q&A session at the end of the workshop, so you can keep posting your questions and our speakers will be happy to take them up. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Sunil. I head data science at Bharat Pay. Uh, at Bharat Pay, we help small and medium-sized merchants in accepting digital payments within a few minutes of getting onboarded into our system. And they can accept payments through their QR codes, through their POS machines. Uh, and that happens within a few seconds. Uh, and we also enable them with financial products for their business growth, like loan or a swipe machine. So our mission is to drive financial inclusion for this particular set of businessmen who were actually ignored earlier uh, by, uh, you know, major uh, big enterprises or the companies who were providing payment solution or financial solutions for enterprises. Uh, so in order to fulfill our mission at uh, that Bharat Pay has, the data plays a very important and central role. Uh, and we are not only a data-driven organization, but we are on our journey where we are moving from being a data-driven to intelligence-driven organization. And how we are able to do that uh, is because of the way we are able to process the big data at scale and, we are, and how we do the analytics in a smarter way and harness the power and the value that the data has for our business decisions. And in fact, this is helping us in achieving a growth that we have not, or in fact, I have not seen in my career before, uh, where we have worked on, you know, organizations with, uh, you know, traditional setups of data analytics and data science. Uh, so how an organization can also go, go on a similar journey, uh, you know, and to achieve higher returns on the investments that they are making on data science and achieve higher outcomes from their data analytics and data science initiatives. So to understand that uh, on, and how one organization can do that, it is important to understand the evolution of data science itself. Uh, according to me, there are, you know, there have been three phases in the data science evolution. And uh, right now we are in the phase three. So what was phase one and two? So phase one was where the data analytics used to happen at a small scale. 
uh, it was limited to very small silos, a few individuals within the companies and who are working on a very small scale of data, which are few hundreds of those. And they're working on credit risk or operational research problem and uh, making decisions. But yes, these decisions were important as well. And they were adding a lot of business value. But the, the, the scale at which we were analyzing the data and processing was pretty small. And this phase lasted for decades. Uh, and in the last decade or so, or 10 to 12 years back is when the, the phase two started, where companies started realizing that we actually do have a lot of data that we have collected over a period of say last years and years. And all the companies are also were also generating data at a very rapid pace. They were on their modernization or digitization journey. And the data generation that was happening was of massive scale. So that's where everyone started asking question that how can we analyze this data that we have in a more efficient and scalable way and move away from a small scale data science. And in the phase two, the focus of the complete data science community or the the, was on how can we process data at scale. Uh, and that's where the, the, the Hadoop, the MapReduce, these technologies came into picture and they helped us understand that, okay, how we can process petabytes of data and do the analysis that we were doing earlier on Excel and uh, even get better accuracies and better results. Another thing that happened in parallel in the phase two uh, is where we saw a lot of maturity and advancement in the data science algorithms of, or the machine learning algorithms where the regression, the, the deep learning and uh, you know, the classification algorithms for processing images, for doing forecasting, et cetera, they evolved a lot. Earlier, these used to be based on uh, you know, estimations, but now they are more and more because we had the capability, we, are, we were able to build better algorithms. And that was the focus for the last decade or so. Uh, and in the last three to four years, we have entered into what I call as a phase three, where we, we are pretty mature in terms of how we process the data, how we gather, how we collect, and how we predict. And in this phase, this is the, according to me, is the best time to be in data analytics or solving problem for a business because uh, you have a lot of data with you and you can actually focus on solving the problem using that or solving a business problem using that. And that too, you can do it pretty fast. And the credit goes to the technologies and the platform that we have today. Uh, you know, we are able to process data, do prediction, have quicker turnaround times to deploy a solution uh, because of the platforms for data processing and data science available today. Uh, so the more focus in the current phase has shifted towards solving and getting the business outcome or business value instead of managing the data or managing the principles, managing data pipelines. And that is where the actual unlock can happen. And it has started for a lot of organization across the globe where they are able to deliver results pretty fast and deliver results in a manner that brings the customer or you know enables the customer delight within the system as well and a lot of organization in the in the in the world who had earlier started in the phase 2 are actually now reaping the benefits in the phase 3 so how as an organization we can achieve the same so in order to for an organization to go on a similar journey uh, and do smart analytics and you know extract or deliver results at a faster pace for a data science vertical. Uh, there are a set of guiding principles that we can take and follow, uh, which can help you understand that, okay, how to navigate this better, right? So the first principle is that think big data. Always when you are creating solutions, when you are designing a pipeline, when you are thinking of how to solve a business problem, uh, think about big data itself, that how can I utilize all the data that I have and then solve this problem instead of you know solving it based on a formula or a function or an analysis that you have done on Excel. Because one, when you are thinking of big data, you can actually get better prediction. You can get better insights into the trends and make better business decisions. Uh, one of the examples that uh, 
we i will i can share from our own experiences at bharat pay is uh, the way we make credit risk decisions to give a loan to merchant uh, right so how, what so we we are helping merchants in accepting payments and uh, merchants have been on our system for last 2 to 3 years so when we started designing the credit risk uh, solution to predict whether to give a loan to merchant or not we have always focused on that how can we understand the merchant's business potential the merchant's capability and the credit worthiness uh, based on the data or the transactions that he has done on our platform for the last 3 years and the the big data first thinking has actually helped us deliver better probability of default models or credit risk models there so when you are th- for thinking first uh, you know in terms of how do i process and solve this problem at scale uh and that's when the actual unlock can start happening the second principle uh will be that always focus on operationalization of the data op- always focus on operation operationalization of the data science outcomes uh that think about how we can optimize the the business analytics or the data science outcomes that we are computing how can i operationalize it in 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 a business process how this outcome can be integrated if it is a prediction how can i take that prediction integrate into a real time decisioning process which can be a fraud process or can be a uh, a credit risk decision process so when you are always thinking about you know focusing on operationalization of the insights and the data uh, and that's where you can actually see it uh, you know giving you feedback quite faster and also bringing in that element of intelligence driven decisioning instead of a data driven decisioning that can happen and this and this focus on operationalization comes you know earlier it used to be the case that a lot of analytics and a lot of data science that uh, teams were doing was limited to the excel sheets or dashboards and the decision that were being taken would take months to be in production so whenever you are designing a solution think about what will you what will be the outcome and how you can operationalize this outcome as soon as possible in your processes uh the next principle uh will be that always build for real time whenever we are designing or solving for a problem we need to think about how can we solve this or can i solve this problem and take this decision in real time can i take or can i take advantage of some of the perishable context or insights that i have and solve and solve a problem or bring the merchant delight there one of the examples that how we are you know how we build for real time and we take this thinking uh, as a principle whenever we are thinking of a business you know solution of a business problem is uh, we are understanding and you know taking the decision whether a merchant is going to churn or not in real time and as soon as we identify that okay this merchant is churning we either send a digital message through whatsapp or through in app notification to merchant for to retain the merchant or at the same time we can also trigger to send a, an agent on the field to meet the merchant and understand why the merchant is churning and that's how you can think about how can i you know think about solutions which can be delivered in real time instead of uh, you know processes which where you will create a list identify which are the people who are going to churn and then you will take action on them after 2 weeks because till that time all that context is lost and the merchant would have already churned so that's why it is very very important for us to think and build for real time another example uh, from our experience can be uh, you know where we have developed an anomaly detection system to process the payments in real time and understand where whether a incoming uh, tra- payment has been initiated by a suspicious actor within the payment network and uh, has ill intention so identifying that in real time and stopping that transaction then and there actually helps us in preventing a lot of fraud and you know helps the payment network and build you know trust in the payment network overall in the network itself so that is why it's important to think about building for real time and whenever you are thinking of building for real time you will always end up building more efficient systems 
uh, then when you're thinking of you know a, a batch process or a process which takes few weeks or months to you know operationalize uh, the last guiding principle will be to you know democratize access to the data the democratization should happen at multiple points the democratization should happen uh, for business analytics or the business team where they have a good visibility of the kpis the business kpis or the data or about the important business metrics at the same time the democratization should also happen for the way analyst or the data analyst or data scientists are processing uh, you know the data the, the how how can you easily process and transform data to create feature sets so in in, in this democratization process uh the tools that we have available in you know it today uh, actually help us standardize a lot, a lot of these processes and you know get outcome in a very standard fashion and very quickly and that is where the platform and we can achieve the democratization in a very smart way and the democratization should also happen not only you know for people who are either processing the data or who are consuming the business insights but it should also be there for systems uh, so let's say you have created you have computed you know a, a business insight a particular kpi on which a decision can be taken and that should be made available in the form of uh, an api which can be consumed by various systems for decisioning so the democratization should be there always you know whenever we are designing the warehouse whenever we are designing how exactly our data platform should look like uh, these four principle should be always at the back of the mind or should form the basis of the how the a data platform should work so just to recap always think big data focus on operationalization uh, build for real time and democratize the access to the data and not only for people but for systems as well so these are the basic you know guiding principles uh, but how exactly we bring this into action is we can actually follow a very you know simple but useful framework uh, to you know to take this principle but how do we apply it how do we go about designing and you know storing and start solving the business problems through the analytics platform that you are building the first step uh, for this framework will be to collect where you should think about collecting all types of data that you have and collect fast uh, by collect fast what i mean is that collect the data as soon as it is generated because once when you are collecting this data at you know in real time you will have the capability to take action on it do analytics on it compute do predictions on it in real time and then you know make a business decision there so whenever you are planning think about collecting all types of data uh, whether it comes from application whether it comes from website or it is coming from a third party data source that you have integrated uh, and there are tools uh, that are available or the technologies that have evolved today that we can do this collect and collect fast in a very smart way where we can plug into different types of data sources very fast and then bring the data into our warehouse or a data lake and you know start processing or even do a real time processing schema check do a prediction in real time uh, so what we need to understand is that earlier it used to be a problem the collecting so much of data and that too at this pace but now the technologies are enabling us uh, and that's what we should start thinking about you know utilizing it and you know we have to start using it to move fast on this journey the next step in the framework will be you know to organize the data that you have collected because this becomes the foundational layer of your overall system that the, the data that you have collected has to be organized in a way that it becomes the single source of truth for the organization uh, that this is the only place that any business analyst any data analyst or data scientist is using and has a common understanding and at the same time this is this is also the layer or the foundation that you use in your data services as well that can be you know when we i was talking about earlier operationalization of data and data science this data can be operationalized in that form as well so this single source of truth is important for us to follow the democratization principle 
because once you have a single source of growth and everyone is using that to make decisions then they will always be in alignment so for to do this processing to create this uh, you know single source of truth or organize it in a much better way it we should understand how to do the data transformation in a, an easy manner but also at the same time in a way that you know these are not very complex because there was a time 5 6 years back when transformation was a very difficult job and uh, we had to write very very complex code to do the transformation but now uh, with the capabilities that are there in the platforms we can actually do this transformation at a, with a very good efficiency accuracy uh, and very fast as well and in a, in a drag and drop manner and that's what we should be thinking about that can i aim for that and organize my data better the next will be uh, once you have organized the data that uh, how do you analyze and predict because you have collected the data you have organized you have computed your business kpi so now it's the time for you to understand the trends understand what the churn rate is understand how a particular business is performing start doing prediction and start you know integrating that into the business processes and that comes to the the last step of the framework where the insights that you are computing the the predictions that you are doing it is very 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 important for us to activate it and that's where the operationalization principle comes into picture and we instantiate through the activation step uh, where we are thinking about how can i activate the activation can happen through multiple points the activation can happen uh, through a business dashboard which helps us track a very important kpi it can be the revenue it can be the profit it can be how how many merchants are active on the platform and tracking of that can lead to some of the actions the team can take right and and that's why the operationalization of this of the data or the insights that you are computing is very important that operationalization can ha happens actually in three ways the one is through these dashboards or these through reports which helps us take day to day business decisions the second operationalization happens through the data services where the these insights which are there on the dashboard should also be available in the form of the api uh, that can be used by various systems for decisioning uh, that i can take a call based on how a particular merchant is performing or where they are in in their overall life cycle and based on that take a decision whether to sell a loan or not or sell another product or not and the third point in the you know activation is about doing the activation in real time and that's where most of the organization are moving towards and we also you know follow the the guiding principle of operationalization of insights or prediction is that the activation in real time is very very important for us to bring in the you know that customer delight from data science and deliver or you know shorten the time to value from whatever we are working on because when you are delivering and solving problems in real time the our business outcomes that it can generate can be manifold and not only that it can actually help businesses understand that okay now since we have these insights these decisions these predictions available to us at the time of let's say filling an application or when a merchant uh, you know is accepting a transaction they the businesses start you know realigning themselves according to this real time information that is there the real time activation of information and prediction which is there so we have and one of the example will be where we have seen is that we are enabling in real time our merch, our agents on the field when they are visiting a merchant that uh, what product to sell to the merchant what will be the right product to sell to the merchant whether it will be a loan or a swipe machine or a card and that is helping us in you know achieving a cross sell a better cross sell percentage for the overall business and at the same time this availability of this information in real time in the in the field is helping them understand their area better and then how they can plan accordingly and that's how the activation of insights in real time is a very important step in the overall framework so what we have so, so these are the you know overall guiding principles and framework uh, that we can follow to unlock the data that we have 
uh, right? And the, and the value from the data, in fact, uh, that we have and do analytics and process and do prediction and get better business results in a much, much smarter way. So yeah, this is it from my side. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Sunil Seni, for kickstarting this workshop and setting the context aptly. Well, organizations around the globe look towards data to drive better outcomes. They focus to better serve their customers, develop better products, run more efficiently, expand their businesses, and develop competitive advantages. Seemingly, everyone knows that data has a significant role to play in today's highly digitized environment, and most organizations think that data alone is self-sufficient. In reality, data is just the raw material needed to generate the insights that can change our business. So how do we harness data in a way that it generates insights that in turn create value? What can industry leaders do differently in this space compared to other businesses? This workshop will enable technology leaders to unleash the full potential of data and transform it into a competitive advantage. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to delve deeper in these areas, I would like to invite our second speaker, Mr. Raghu Dubey, Customer Engineer, Data Analytics, Google Cloud, to share his insights. I would like to remind you that you can post your questions in the questions section as we will have a Q&A session at the end of the workshop. Thanks a lot, Sunil, for, uh, for those awesome insights. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raghu. I'm a data analytics specialist working with Google Cloud India. Uh, it's really great, and it's really a pleasure to be a part of uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, meet today. Um, and, and I'll just, just start from where Sunil left off. So you know, I, I really want to call out some of the awesome things which he mentioned. Number one, uh, you know, focusing on big data, thinking through big data, essentially, as you start your journey. Second focusing on the operationalization of your data and analytics pipelines. Third, building a real-time mindset, because I think that's, that's very, very important. And fourth, democratizing all of that data and all of those insights to empower your employees, to empower your uh, you know, customers, your partners, and you know, the, uh, the user base really, really grows because the reach grows a lot. And as I continue to work with a lot of customers across multiple industries, I can't agree more to these points. Um, and and it's also very obvious that you know the the promise which data AI and and all these technologies bring is unprecedented, undeniable. What what I really think though is that you know it's at this moment all the companies across various industries really realize that in order to really sustain and benefit in this digital era where you know there is a very fast transformation, very fast digitalization of each and everything which exists physically, it's important to become data-driven. Or rather, um, I would take it a step further, it's important to become not only data-driven, but also event-driven. But you know, if you, if you look at it, it's, it's still very difficult. Uh, there was a research which was done by BCG Group, which really calls out, as shown on the screen, that just 10% of the organizations are able to achieve significant financial benefits from data and AI. Um, there was also one of the uh, studies where you know a lot of senior executive leadership from different different organizations were uh, really you know uh, asked to uh, tell as to what is the maximum uh, bandwidth or what is what is the uh, you know what are those top priorities which really keep them occupied most of the times and as you can imagine on the left hand side of the screen is big data artificial intelligence machine learning were really contributing close to two third of their mindset. Now that, that's really huge. But with all of this, there are a lot of challenges which are also there which we need to overcome. And if you look at the first challenge, it's, it's the challenge of big data itself. We are all aware of the problem of variety, uh, velocity, and volume. But then when you look at the data, and it's, it's gonna be around 180, one zettabytes of data which are expected by 2025, you will realize 
that data is not only big, but it's multi-format also. So you may have uh, structured data, unstructured data. This could manifest in various types of formats. Uh, so you could have data which is coming from uh, you know, APIs. You could have data which is a click stream data. This could be data which is being streamed and is you know, where you're continuously recording your user behavior as they visit your websites, right? So there, there could be data which is of a huge number of variety there could be data which is also streaming in nature. And at the same time, there could be data which is mostly at rest. These, these could be files on the SFTP service. These could be files residing on various cloud storages and so on and so forth. But you know, somewhere or the other, we, we as organizations struggle to really get this data and process this data. And last but not the least, we are increasingly seeing multi-cloud adoption, which means that your applications may be residing on one cloud, your data may be residing, or your data analytics and machine learning may be residing on another cloud, or you know, it could be a mix of this. Add to it the complexity of your data residing on on-premise system or your applications residing on on-premise system and the need to integrate them with your entire data analytics system. Challenge number two is there are various different ways in which we have started to consume the data. Or, or essentially start working with the data. When I say data requires more than SQL, I, I literally mean it because you know it's not just SQL which can enable us to consume the data, although it's really one of the great assets, I must say. But at the same time, you also have various other ways to consume the data. So for example, you may be consuming the data through various machine learning frameworks, right? You may be um, using various uh, SDKs in Python, Go, Java, and, and multiple other languages to consume that data. Uh, there could also be situations where um, you are you have built your analytics in such a way that they need to be embedded into a corporate enterprise portal, or they really need to be embedded at much more granular level uh, through an API calls inside your applications, which may in turn be getting accessed by thousands and thousands and uh, you know more of users either through mobile apps or through enterprise portals. So with with this limitless data right it's not just one framework it's it's it becomes you know huge variety which which is you know big in its own and third the data which you process may not remain within your boundaries what i mean by that is that once you have processed your data you will start thinking about how can i benefit the organization overall with that data you may end up uh, sharing data with your employees you may end up sharing data with your customers you may end up uh, even getting to a place where you start, uh, you know, creating data services on top of the data to uh, to really serve your end customers, right? Or essentially even start um, those data services so that they are some sort of subscriptions and you're able to monetize the data assets that you have built. Um, and of course, you know, this also comes with the complexity that when you start sharing your data, you need to ensure that you are also, uh, you know, securing the data. If if there is any PII information, you are removing that. If there is any kind of access control which needs to be applied, you are applying those access controls. Uh, so all of those things need to be in place. Um, very recently, right? We we got one very clear metric that around 4,500 organizations securely shared over 250 petabytes of data with BigQuery. That, and that's just, just one of the metrics, I'll come to it later. But then the, the reach of your data due to the variety of ways in which uh, you, know, you, can, you can manifest your data uh, across the ecosystem is essentially getting to, uh, you know, it's uh, in a very limitless uh, fashion. Now, if you, if you think all these three th challenges in a slightly different perspective, what you will realize is that these three challenges have manifested over you know, last decade or more in a variety of problems. Now, um, you may end up creating duplicate copies of data. There could be multiple data silos if there are multiple organizations or uh, let me call it BUs within the organizations which are existing and are processing the data independently. It may also happen that these different BUs may end up exposing the data in ways in which you did not expect. Right? So there could be uh, certain compliance issues or security issues for regulated industries. Um, there could be issues related to inappropriate access of the data and so on and so forth. Right? And, and these could cost uh, a lot uh, you know, to your organization. As we speak, 
68% uh, of the companies are unable to realize measurable value from data. And, uh, and, and that's really two thirds, which is a big number. Now, you would imagine that how, how we at Google Cloud can help you there. I think we are at a unique position and we are very familiar with the issue because, you know, due to the nature of operations, which we have uh, for more than two decades now, we know that what it takes to really have data, operate data at a scale, and also deliver analytics out of this data at a scale. Uh, and it's, it's, not a, it's not a hidden uh, secret that there are more than nine Google applications which have more than 1 billion users. Um, on, the, on the screen, you see the very familiar UI of Google search. And you know, we use it day in, day out without even knowing that a simple text item which you're going to type on this API, on this, uh, on this screen, is going to call multiple machine learning models and, and multiple uh, you know, complex infrastructure which are there at the back end to give you highly personalized and relevant search results. And, and, and you know, the, the infrastructure which has allowed it to scale so well is what we're going to talk about in next few minutes. Uh, first thing first, uh, you know, when I talk about all these uh, various nine applications which have more than 1 billion users, or if I talk about, uh, you know, the way we operate at Google at a scale, you might question that, how can I run like Google also? And, and that's, a, that's a very common question which I do receive, whether, whether I'm talking about data analytics, whether I'm talking about machine learning, and so on and so forth. And, and the idea is like, you need to think through as to how to design your data warehouse, your data lakes, and your complete data ecosystem in a way that it can process limitless data, it can work with limitless types of workloads, and it can allow you to reach to your users in a very, very scalable or limitless manner. And that's where we have Google Data Cloud. And at the core of the Google's Data Cloud is BigQuery. Now, some of you may have used BigQuery, some of you may not have used BigQuery, but then this is, this is not just a warehouse. Uh, you might have heard that BigQuery is a warehouse, but then it's, uh, it's, it's really much, much more than a warehouse. And that's why it's, it's you know, at the core of the data cloud. Um, if you look at the way we operate, we use BigQuery day in, day out, both its data analytics as well as machine learning capabilities to power multiple services, which uh, you as users and you as your organizations use day in, day out. Um, three things which I would uh, very specifically want to call out for BigQuery is how it's quite different from the way you would have expected you know, some of the other offerings. Number one, it it stands on a storage system which is quite limitless in reach. Uh, we call it Colossus, right? So Colossus is Google's globally distributed uh, storage system which runs BigQuery internally and, and all of the data which is in BigQuery resides on the Colossus file system, of course, in a columnar format. And this file system essentially handles any type of replication, any type of, type of recovery uh, from failures and durability without you having to worry about anything. Um, the complete cluster management internally, which happens, is done through Google Borg. Now, we have used this for years, and, and we continue to use it for our internal as well as uh, you know, multiple Google Cloud offerings. Uh, and third, the compute, which is there, that's based on Dremel. And Dremel is completely stateless. When I say completely stateless, you know, the way it will convert for you is that if there is a certain cluster somewhere residing, some Dremel cluster residing, and it fails altogether, your queries will not be interrupted because it's, it's really fluid in the way BQ operates. And, and last but not the least, due to the nature of BigQuery storage and the compute and their complete delinking, you are able to use BigQuery storage as a full-fledged data lake also. So that's where the boundaries between a um, warehouse and a lake start to fail. In fact, they have failed. Um, today, I'm going to talk about three high-level aspects. Number one, we're going to talk about limitless data and how BigQuery helps you achieve that. We're going to talk about how BigQuery fits in the overall ecosystem and the various workloads which are possible uh, to run on top of BigQuery using the overall offerings which are within the Google Data Cloud ecosystem. And third, 
there are various ways in which you will be able to consume that data as an end user, um, as a subscription service. You know, depends on how and how you built your use cases essentially. Uh, you know, out of out of BigQuery. Now let's start with uh, limitless data first. Number one. BigQuery is completely serverless. When I say completely serverless, it's really important to look at the architecture diagram on the right-hand side. Um, on the left, you have uh, the BigQuery distributed storage, which I, in one of the previous slides, I talked about Colossus, right? On the right-hand side, you have Dremel. These two are completely independent. So you, you may have, you know, petabytes of data on BigQuery storage, but then if you're not querying it, you'll not incur charges because Querying scales independently of a storage. And that's, that's very important. Another very important angle of this is that if you look at between the compute, which is Dremel, and the storage, which is the BigQuery storage, uh, there are two way uh, lines which are appearing. And there we have a petabit network, which ensures that any kind of shuffling which happens. And, and you know, uh, if you're familiar with the distributed data computing ecosystem, shuffling is always a pretty difficult nut to crack because you know, data can move from one node to the another node in, very, in a variety of ways and in a, in a, you know, a pretty unpredictable fashion. So we have really optimized this shuffling tier within BigQuery and it also operates on a petabyte scale network, which ensures that it's, pretty seamless uh, communication between the compute and the storage. Um, and at the same time, it's completely serverless, uh, the way it scales. And that's the reason, you know, many of our customers who use BigQuery have really developed an attitude that, okay, I don't need to think about infrastructure. I don't need to think about any capacity planning. I, I just, you know, bring in my data and get going, you know, just add data to BigQuery and get going. And I think that's the place where things become quite, quite simplified. Um, at the same time, uh, if you look at, you know, uh, the other aspect which I was talking about in the initial slides in the initial challenges is that there is a huge variety of data which is out there. If you, if you think about the data which is there, right, it could be structured data, semi-structured data, you know, it could be uh, textual data. There are various open data formats also like Parquet, JSON, uh, and, and many of the times, uh, you know, these various APIs or user behavior data is highly nested in the structure, which is, and, and it ends up happening somewhere between the boundary of a structured and unstructured data. All of that is something which BQ can accommodate, right? So you, there, are, uh, there are ways in which you can ingest all of this data in a very simplified manner inside BigQuery. Um, another aspect which comes into the play is that you know we feel that increasingly there is going to be multi-cloud adoption, um, and multi-cloud may get used in multiple ways. Uh, it, it it could get used uh, you know where you have your data analytics split across multiple clouds. It could get used in ways where you have your applications uh, in one cloud or with one vendor, while you have your data analytics with another vendor. So there could be a huge variety in which you know this uh, multi-cloud journey may frame up. But what we have done is like, we are well prepared for this uh, multi-cloud adoption with BigQuery Omni. So, so for example, with BigQuery Omni, you get one single control plane, which is your BQ control plane, where you can query the data, which is in BigQuery's native storage on GCP, as well as this data could also reside in you know, certain AWS, Amazon S3 buckets, or you know, Azure Data Lake Gen 2, et cetera. So that gives you really a single pane where you can uh, query your data and you know, uh, do your analytics. Um, another important aspect, when we talk about lake houses or you know, data warehouses and so on and so forth, is how am I gonna govern and have a single uh, place where I can control data which is residing in a warehouse, uh, that, like BigQuery, data which is residing on, you know, object storages, let's say like Google Cloud Storage or um, Amazon S3 or Azure Data Lake Gen 2, et cetera, right? How can I access all of this data from a single place and also have a good level of governance built on top of it, right? That's the place where our big lake architecture comes into the picture. And, and it's really, you know, combines your warehouse as well as lake. As you can see on the bottom of this architecture, uh, we have, you know, your BigQuery managed storage, we have Google Cloud storage, 
uh, we have Amazon S3, uh, and we have you know multiple other clouds. So you're you're getting a single pane to access the data across various formats, uh, work through the BigQuery storage APIs, and then run on top of it various open source frameworks or BigQuery compute to analyze your data. Right. So that's that's really really you know a powerful way in which you can process and consume your data. Um, another very important aspect which I refer to in the challenge number three is how do you give access to more and more of your data and being a, be able to leverage it you know, within as well as beyond your organization. That's the place where we think start to think about data exchanges. When I say, um, when I say data exchanges, what I really mean to uh, you know, emphasize is that once you have the data, right, and, and you have processed it for, uh, for yourself, you may want to expose it to your, uh, you know, consumers, of course, you know, that's, that's usually one of the key stakeholders. But then once you have that, uh, you know, that initial uh, layer sorted where you are able to share it with your uh, internal audience, which would be, you know, your employees or your direct consumers, you might also want to um, have a mechanism where you want to share it with broader partner ecosystems. These could be various suppliers to your business. These could be retailers, or maybe uh, there are logistics providers who are attached to your business and so on and so forth, right? At times, it could be um, even banks, right? So, so you may be a fintech, you have, you know, uh, some, uh, some good quality data, and you really want to expose it as a, as a service to uh, some of the other bank or the regulatory authorities. In all of these situations, you need to have a strong, robust, uh, performing data access layer, which is, uh, you know, which can be either directly accessed or sold through a subscription. And there could be multiple ways and means in which you can uh, you know, think about consuming the data. That's the place where BigQuery Analytics Hub comes into the picture, right? So that's, that's a central place from where you can essentially uh, you know, create data sets which are shareable beyond your organizational boundaries as well. Uh, now, we have already talked about the limitless data. Let's talk about the wider ecosystem, which, uh, you know, which is there as part of the Google Cloud, Google Data Cloud. Um, and that's the place where we get into the various, uh, you know, supporting frameworks which are uh, available in the Google Cloud, Data Cloud ecosystem. Uh, so BigQuery and the whole Google Data Cloud is about simplification. When I say simplification, simplification in terms of collection of data, simplification in terms of storage of data, simplification in terms of processing of the data and consumption and activation, right? So when I say all of that, uh, you know, it's, it's a, <laughs> I, I understand it's a, a bunchful uh, or it's a mouthful, uh, you know, uh, number of words, but then the idea is that how can we simplify this whole stack from collection till activation or consumption, for example. So if you, Look at this, uh, this simple diagram, which I have uh, in front of me. It's, it's really talking about various data sources, which could be you know, your uh, you know, uh, sources coming from manufacturing. It could be sources uh, which are coming from retail, you know, streaming data, batch data, multiple types of data sets, which could be appearing in a variety of formats. And then you're able to integrate or you're able to ingest that data and process that data using either direct BQ integrations so, so BigQuery comes with data transfer services, uh, which can essentially help you bring data from a variety of sources with just a single click from the UI without using any ETO tools. Um, if you have more complex requirements, whether it could be streaming or batch, we can use Dataflow, which is based on open source Apache Beam. Or for that matter, if you're comfortable with Apache Spark, you can use Apache Spark to bring in that data right, and uh, into BigQuery. And once you have all of that data, you can do machine learning on top of the BigQuery itself. You can build very rich applications using Looker. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Looker in a moment, but then for, for now, you know, uh, think of it that it's, it's one of the Google's enterprise class uh, BI data platforms, which are available out here. And then if you have anything which, where you want to do any kind of uh, machine learning, that's the place where our Vertex AI platform comes into the picture. So you have this whole suite of things as part of uh, you know, the ecosystem, right? With BigQuery uh, being at the center or at the core of the ecosystem. Um, at the same time, 
think of his spark right we were just talking about uh, apache spark and and his spark is uh, i think one of the most loved tools out there by data engineers as well as data scientists with bigquery and the google's data cloud his spark is a first class citizen especially with bigquery you have capabilities where you can in one tab just start typing sql and it will run on your bigquery and then another tab if let's say you have some uh, spark sql which you need to write you can just open a new tab write your spark sql and then it's going to run right and and it's all seamless you don't really um, need to spin up a spark cluster you, you don't need, really need to plan all of those things up front which end up happening and you know um, that's, that's also one of the reason i am just trying to recall one of the uh, statements which were there that uh, you you end up only uh using 40% of your time or 40 or 50% of your time to do coding or real application work while rest of the time 50 to 60% of the time goes into infrastructure management i think i think we are we are drastically simplifying all of these processes uh with with bigquery and spark integration i would also like to say that uh with serverless spark which is actually running on data proc uh you do get a lot of uh you know benefit in terms of cost also uh um, because you only pay for the the amount of cpu and the amount of ram which was consumed during the processing of your workflows another important aspect is streaming analytics right um and i'll just try to go back to what sunil had mentioned some time back where he mentioned that think real time uh i i really really uh you know appreciate what he put forward here we have to think real time and and speed is really you know a core part of the game now when i say that uh, i would also want to call out that bigquery was built with real time in mind right so just like you can uh, thread the bigquery storage uh, as a data lake you can also write into bigquery in a streaming fashion um, you can really you know ingest huge amounts of data millions of rows per second and use the streaming api for ingestion of those events um one one very nice thing which i want to call out is that you know when you when you ingest this all of this data in a typical you know traditional data warehouse or some of the data warehouses which are available from other vendors uh, or or even data lakes which are based on hadoop and spark you end up creating a small files right which over a period of time as they gather they really reduce the performance of your warehouse or or let me call it the data lake as well or the lake house for example in all these situations bigquery has an advantage that you don't really have to worry about this small file problem it has all the mechanisms in built to manage those small files to ensure that you are always getting optimum query time uh but but you know just just quickly let's let, let's take a look at um, this this diagram from left to right right so let's say you have a lot of streaming data which needs to be ingested right the first point the first thing which you'll start thinking about is like okay do i have a messaging service yes we do have upsub is that messaging service which is completely serverless highly scalable can ingest you know uh, gbs of hundreds of gbs of data per second and while it does that it also has native integration with something called cloud data flow which i talked you know just a few minutes back and with upsub and cloud data flow you have a real time pipeline which can read the data from upsub stream process the data do the transformation in real time and write it back to the bigquery streaming api for uh, you know immediate consumption um if you move towards the right hand side you will also see that there is something called bi engine um bi engine is is really a in memory analytics engine and what it allows you to do is that any kind of uh, bi platform let's say you know it could be looker it could be a uh, power bi it could be data studio it could be a uh, tableau right so there could be multiple uh, you know bi tools which go ahead and query your warehouse and these tools need to be very very performant they need to you know really refresh your dashboards uh, very fast that's the place where bi engine layer really uh, you know starts to make a difference because all of these dashboards don't necessarily always need to hit bigquery they they should be served out of cache or 
at the same time they should also um, you know enable any kind of analytics which is residing on top of the data in the cache without really even going to the underlying warehouse right so that's the place where bi engine comes into the picture and allows this to happen in a very seamless manner allowing you sub second query responses um and and you know not to mention there is this partner ecosystem as well uh, which can integrate very well to bigquery and we'll we'll see there are more than 700 odd partner ecosystem uh, you know offerings which are out there um built in ai ml i think this is this is a very important facet of uh, the data cloud when we say built in ai ml more often than not what happens is that if you have to do data analytics um, uh, you know on a warehouse yes you are able to do it but then as soon as you get into a state where you have to do machine learning right you end up creating certain pipelines which will essentially move the data out of your warehouse put it somewhere on top of which your uh, machine learning will operate right now with big query machine learning which is essentially you know i call it embedded machine learning in the warehouse itself there is no data movement all you are doing is you are using sql to create your data models and really perform the complete cycle which starts from explorative data analysis till deployment all through sql now now just think about it how powerful it is right and how drastically it can get simplify it can really simplify the uh, machine learning workflow and the life of the data scientists right so so that's 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 really uh, you know a powerful mechanism in which uh, you know it can help you out another thing which i would want to talk about is in the same class of built in ai ml is vertex ai so so vertex ai is a comprehensive machine learning offering which has you know which which really allows you to have a low level uh, you know um, control of your environment if you in case you're want to use you know deep learning virtual, uh, virtual machines or if you want to use multiple building blocks like you know let's say custom modeling using jupyter lab notebooks or serverless training prediction services any kind of model registry which you want to maintain feature store and so on and so forth right all of these are available as building blocks in a serverless manner and and also there is a variety of auto ml models which are available which really allow you to just provide the label data set and rest of the heavy lifting is done is done by the uh, you know vertex ai automated models also uh, itself so in in all those uh, situations right this is a very nice combination because vertex ai on one hand will allow you to do your machine learning uh, to the extent you want and at the same time it also integrates very nicely to bigquery in fact a um, lot of our customers use vertex ai workbench which is actually managed jupyter lab notebooks and connect it on top of bigquery datasets and do the machine learning within the you know within the jupyter lab notebooks and once they are done they just go ahead and you know with with uh, various types of you know mechanisms which are built like vertex ai pipelines which are essentially internally queue flow pipelines they are able to deploy those models another important aspect is the integration what if you build your uh, uh, big qml models which were based on sql and then you want to deploy it on vertex ai the good part is that that is also available with a single click right so so you can um, you know just just create your model in bq and then with two three lines of commands you will be able to register it and version control it with the vertex ai model registry so so think think of it right you have you have all your vertex ai models you have all your uh, bqml models everything centrally managed version control from one single place right and for those of you who have who might not know vertex ai uh, and again this, this this will be a very short session to talk about it but then it's our uh, comprehensive machine learning platform which really allows you to have everything from ingestion up till the deployment for online predictions at one place it gives you unique machine learning Uh, operations capabilities with allowing you complete automation any type of retraining uh, any kind of you know uh, model monitoring and then retraining the models to ensure that you know there's uh, any kind of uh, you know schema drifts or any kind of uh, training serving skews don't happen um that said uh, you know bq is extendable also 
right? So, so if let's say you have certain functions which you have written outside of uh, BigQuery, right? This could be Node.js function, this could be Python functions. You can actually call them from within BigQuery, right? Um, another aspect is many customers, right? Um, you know, you, you, you create your warehouse, but at times you also have requirements where you directly want, you, maybe there is no data pipeline existing and you directly want to query one of the transactional databases which you have, right? Aka federated querying as we call it nowadays. So in all those situations, you do have the capability to do federated querying directly on top of BigQuery. So for example, uh, from the BigQuery console itself, you will be able to uh, query your cloud SQLs. You'll be able to query Google Cloud Spanner. You'll be able to query Bigtable, and and not to mention, right? BigQuery also supports external tables through which you can query, you know, various types of parquets on CSV files and all those things, you know, residing on your uh, Google Cloud Storage. Um, now uh, we have talked about, you know, the whole ecosystem. Uh, I'll just quickly hop on to uh, the, you know. How, how this uh, data platform is really built for everyone. Now, you know, what, what I'm sharing on my screen is, is not, not really something new, but, but then uh, it's, it's much more simplified uh, within our ecosystem, right? So typically uh, you end up having different types of personas. There could be developers who are, you know, really hardcore focused on that, okay, hey, I, I want to you know, ingest this data in a streaming fashion. I want to build this pipeline. I want to use this particular library and so on and so forth, right? While at the same time, there could be a data analyst who, you know, who will not be so neck deep into you know, the nitty gritties of the overall pipeline, but then he would want to analyze uh, his data, right? And he would want to get some output very quickly. And at the same time, he might be seeking certain uh, ways in which if some data has to be ingested, you know, can I ingest it without writing any kind of complex SQL? Um, and, and then if you look at the security admin, right, they would have, um, you know, questions where can I, you know, have better governance and access control of my data. With this data cloud, you have all of that residing at one place. Um, finally, when you are trying to consume your data, Right? You have multiple ways in which you can do with a single click. So for example, once you have written a query and you are, uh, you are able to uh, you know, fire that statement, let's say some of your IT decision makers want to analyze data in a spreadsheet manner. So from the BQ console itself, as you can see in one of the animations which are playing, you can uh, just simply export the data into a Google spreadsheet and do all the regular pivoting and Excel-like calculations there. Uh, you can export the data and directly connect to Google Data Studio, which is a free BI platform uh, available out there and you know, start analyzing immediately. And then last but not the least, Looker. Uh, that's our enterprise uh, BI platform. And that's the place where you would come and start thinking through how you can maximize the reach of your data across and you know, beyond your organization. Um, if you have not, uh, you know, really seen Looker, I highly encourage you to do so, uh, because with with Looker, right, you have a lot of capabilities. And when I say a lot of capabilities, um, you know, one of the key things which I really love about Looker is the in database architecture, right? So more often than not, when you are uh, using a BI tool, you get constraints by the processing capabilities of the BI tool itself, even though your underlying warehouse may be highly, uh, you know, um, uh, highly distributed and uh, massively parallel processing, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, data structure. But then um, if you look at the BI part, you know, and they, they start ingesting the data and, you know, somewhere or the other, you start struggling on the BI part. With Looker in database architecture, that doesn't happen because it is really built to utilize the underlying data warehouses capabilities. Uh, second, uh, when you think Looker, we are also thinking scale, right? So, so it's really uh, consumable through APIs and not only dashboard, but the individual dimensions and measures which you create in Looker are consumable through APIs and can be embedded in a custom dashboard. Uh, we have various, you know, customers and these are like, you know, uh, published case studies for Wix. Uh, which has more than 1 million plus monthly active users. Um, Credit Karma uses Looker, uh, you know, for more than 200,000 users. And, and these are like very, uh, you know, uh, scaled customers who are working with Looker. The last thing which I just quickly wanted to uh, call up before I summarize is that, you know, with Looker, there's this concept of blocks. Uh, 
which have this look ml schema already built in look ml is the core semantic model which is available with looker it really allows you to have a one stop shop for all your measures for all your kpis everything residing in a version controlled manner and then it can be some it's, it's something which can be exposed through the visualization or directly through the apis with looker blocks the advantage is that for many common data sources you will see like a lot of uh, things which i have mentioned on the slide are you know google marketing data sources like ads or search but then a lot of other third party data sources ticketing tools all of them have available looker blocks which come with the visualization as well as the semantic model right so you know it's it's a matter of you just bring the data uh, onto bigquery and then start analyzing with looker as long as you have you know uh, you know uh, got these blocks in place and yeah that's that's mostly uh, you know what i wanted to talk on uh, from a uh, data cloud perspective i i think i have covered it all uh, but this this lot is still left uh, which i think you know might not be possible during this session for example uh, within our ecosystem if you want to do personalized recommendations as customers browse your website for product catalog you can do that using recommendations ai um there are various industries which rely heavily on document processing right these documents could be um in uh, jpeg images these documents could be in pdf files and so on and so forth so all these companies can use document ai across various industries to take that unstructured data put some structure on top of it and take it forward uh and then finally there are uh, pre trained apis uh, for vision for translation for uh natural language processing video etc and the, and really the list goes on right which you can utilize without even have to having to worry about uh, any kind of machine learning uh life cycle activities um now i'll i'll quickly switch on to to you know what what customers say because i believe um that's that's one of the best testimonies we could have um we'll start with with bharat pay we uh, you know sunil just called out that um you know one of the key areas which they want to work for is solving for financial inclusion and i think that's really really important um we as google cloud we are trying to do our bit over there um currently if you look at you know there are they are running massively uh, scale uh, real time as well as batch pipelines on google cloud data platform uh, and and they are using a variety of services like popsub dataflow uh, dataproc and and datastream um there is also a significant usage of bigquery itself as the data warehouse platform and and that's the place where the power of democratization is coming into the play and they are using bigquery both as a lake as a warehouse um uh, there are models which are being created with bigquery machine learning uh, vertex ai uh, vision apis are being utilized etc for multiple use cases um so that's that's you know uh, you know uh, a really uh, is scaled implementation i would say uh for um verizon right initially they used to use a lot of uh, large hadoop clusters to process their petabyte scale data but then as their operations scaled uh, you know a lot of nuances has started to come in terms of sla to process the data in terms of the accuracy of the data that's the place where they got huge benefit when they shifted onto bigquery right and and you know it's it's always been a forward journey from there uh um, if you look as look at ather energy right it's they have built a intelligent uh, electric scooter that has various capabilities in terms of uh, route optimization on the go uh, it can also um, go ahead and do its own predictive maintenance because it's all sensor based right um, so that's the place where they are using cloud iot core along with bigquery to really fasten up the innovation uh, cycle with this with their products um freshworks is a very well known name uh, in corporate circles as well as in the indian startup ecosystem um they 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 have built huge and they have built very effective and large scale integration with the google ads and bigquery um essentially just to quote you know they are able to analyze and improve performance of 4000 marketing campaigns per year which is which is really you know uh, tying up to 70% of their revenues um another good example is icici prudential so they are you know one of the biggest users of vision api and they literally process more than 100000 documents in 20 minutes with automated document processing which is there and and you know the 
you know, our, our ecosystem continues to grow. We have um, enterprises across all the regions, uh, you know, working with us and leveraging our services and give, even giving us an opportunity to, to help them out in whatever way we can. Um, there is also a, a growing set of partners, uh, more than 700 plus, who are specializing across the complete cycle, uh, starting from ingestion till activation. Um, and, you know, I think um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to see how exciting this journey continues to happen. Um, with that, um, I'm pretty much done. Um, thanks a lot uh, for your time and being here. Thank you so much, Mr. Raghu Dubey, for the in-depth and comprehensive presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, as promised, it is now time for the Q&A session. We have received a number of queries throughout the workshop, but we will be putting across very relevant and pertinent questions to our guests on the workshop topic and try finding the answers to them. Let me once again introduce our guests, Mr. Sunil Saini, Head Data Science at Bharat Pay, and Mr. Raghu Dube, Customer Engineer, Data Analytics, Google Cloud. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us today. And now heading straight to our Q&A session, we have received a number of queries throughout our workshop, and we will be taking these queries one by one. My first question would be for Sunil. How to determine critical KPIs through the analytics derived scenario? So how to determine, if I understand the question correctly, you are saying yes. how to determine critical KPIs. Critical KPIs, absolutely. See, for the critical KPIs, you have to understand the business very well. Uh, so as a data science team, as a data analysis team, it is important for you to have a good set of conversation with your business to understand what drives business, what drives growth, or what impacts business in a negative way or a particular process in a negative way. And identify, and this can be done over a period of you know, user sessions so three to four sessions for a particular business vertical or for the organization as a whole. And after that, you can derive that, okay, what are the few main important KPIs or the performance indicators for your business? For example, for payments, for us, it is the amount of transaction or the number of transaction we process in a day or in a month. Uh, similarly, the value of transaction that we process. Mm -hmm. And for our lending business, it is the amount of loan that we have dispersed. Mm -hmm. So it is very, very important for you to understand the, you know, how to identify the KPI and mm -hmm. use it as a North Star metric for your organization. Absolutely. Uh, Raghu, how do you suggest that we, uh, that uh, what we should do for visualization of the pro pro uh, processed data? Right. See, um, you know, we can talk about tools, but I'll just talk in general, right? Mm. Uh, so just a few minutes back, we talked about that uh, within the GCP ecosystem, we have Google right. Data Studio, which is right. available right there, right? Uh, you have Looker for any kind of enterprise level visualization and semantic modeling. So those tools are available, but I think even before we get to the tools, it's very important. And you know, just adding on to what Sunil said, right? No visualization is good, you know, unless it really serves the kind of KPIs which we need to visualize, Absolutely. right? So it's it's really important to chalk out what those KPIs are, right? And once you have chalked out those KPIs, it's also important to make those KPIs available across the organization in a pretty much version controlled way, right? Because mm -hmm. over a period of time, we are, you know. Uh, creating visualizations, um, you know, you have uh, different views within the same group who are creating similar type of visualizations using similar type of metrics, but then those KPI definitions differ. Right. So, so essentially, if you ask me from a process standpoint, it would be quite important to have a warehouse slash lake layer, which is the base yeah. layer. Uh, after that, we have a set of KPIs which are common, you know, across mm -hmm. and they are agreed to upon. Right. right. In, a, in a central catalog. And then we version control it, we manage it. Uh, you know, let's say, let me talk about Looker, for example. Right. So you can there go ahead and create a set of KPIs mm -hmm. and then you can version control it. You can give your end users a drag and drop interface to explores mm -hmm. that they are able to drag drop those APIs, consume them, reuse the same KPIs and, you know, uh, individual explores or uh, I would say looks as we call it, you know, from a technical standpoint across multiple dashboards. So, hmm. you know, it's, it starts from 
you know your data model and then it goes to the visualization we are able where you are able to have those kpis reuse those kpis and you know take it forward i think it's very important to have that data model in place data yeah. model in place and when we talk about visualization sunil which tools do you use for visualization of big data so uh, we use a couple of tools to you know visualization or if to use a broader term to explore the data right, right. so when you are analyzing the data or making data driven decisions uh, some of the things that you would like to do is explore at the same time also you know understand certain business kpis as you said mm. so for the exploration part uh, what you would like to do is you would like to you know query data a lot and understand various aspects by combining different types of information together so for that what we do use we use google bigquery's console admin for our warehouse query at the same time we also use you know open source tools like metabase to understand some and answer some of these questions quickly for the right. exploration uh, on the reporting part we utilize tableau for our reporting and dashboarding and you know interacting with the data right uh, rahu i think the same question i'll put across to you as well that sure. which tools uh, do you use for the visualization of big data ah that's a, <laughs> that that's really a very broad question uh, tools galor right is starting from you know free tools which are available there maybe in the you know open source ecosystem some of the apache tools right like mm. let's say a lot of customers use uh, you know open source ecosystem so, so you, i mean if you i said the hundreds of tools right i have i have seen users use data studio looker tableau metabase apache superset um, lots yeah. and lots of tools are there right and um, i think what's more important is like what a particular organization wants to use right at mm. times the goal is just visualization right. right where you don't really need a proper semantic model right, right. um maybe that's the place where you will end up you know going ahead and using some of the tools like let's say you might be able to work your way through uh, data studio or apache superset and so on right when you start getting to a stage where you need reusability some enterprise class level features in terms of having a centralized uh, kpi catalog you know version controls and everything that's the place where you will start getting into the next level of visualization i i don't even call it visualization i mm -hmm. call it bi data platform now it's a mouthful of words like you know at times we call it bi platform we call it data platform i'm mixing bi data platform but i'm mixing it for a very specific reason is that you know eventually as your organization grows you would want to have a system which manages both mm -hmm. uh right so options are there right i think uh, it will be use case dependent and scale dependent so there are so many other questions raghu uh, the other question which we have got from the audience uh, it's for you only how big query will handle large data of connected two wheeler data for real time decision to customer as well as to the new product development team to manufacturing and suppliers got it so um one thing which i already talked about is bq is natively having features of streaming ingestion there is right. a specific api for streaming ingestion uh, typically let's say you know uh, there are two wheelers right uh, there could be some gps sensors or there could be some other engine related sensors right and now nowadays we are talking about electric vehicles right they themselves right. come with a different set of parameters so all of this information can be fed through a system called iot core now we did not discuss a lot on iot core Mm -hmm. but then there are ways and mechanisms to publish this data onto iot core which is google's uh, you know uh, iot ecosystem and from there we can stream this data out to pubsub in real time uh, it will eventually move the data to bigquery in real time using let's say you know data flow for example which i talked about something that mm -hmm. um and this this ingestion right can be very much real time right we have we have found that you know you are able to uh, have records from source to target in under you know uh, a second i i mean or you know half a second or something like that right so it all depends like what's your requirements of uh, you know uh, data ingestion are and once you have that data on top of it it's up to you uh, how quickly you want to utilize it right you may directly query on top of that raw data you may have certain machine learning models built in bigquery ml which operate on top of that raw data right so i mean ingestion is is something which is uh, you know supported and you know we can really scale up to thousands and thousands of uh, records right. per second with bq right in fact we um, do we mm. we do you know stream a lot of records into bq yeah. at right. uh, bharat pay in real time 
how big a sunil how big query is a serverless service this i would like you to explain sorry can you please repeat your question how big query is a serverless service so see in in terms of serverless uh, the important point the or the important part of the question is the serverless right so when mm. anything is serverless it means that you do not have to manage it mm. right and when you manage something you have to provide a certain set of resources and if and you have to keep maintaining those resources and keep Absolutely. tracking and see that if these are being utilized 200% or 90% and that the queries or the performance will slow down but when something is serverless like bigquery you mm -hmm. do not have to think about managing or how much you know how how much resources will be required at the back end for it to analyze a specific set of data for any requirement right uh, so being serverless helps bigquery in scaling and we are able to analyze data of our transactions for the last 2 to 3 years within few seconds right and that's where the serverless part comes in that it knows when to scale for a you know a question that is being asked which will analyze a huge amount of data and to and when to use the less resources when the question is small enough that it can be answered with a very efficient query itself so we do not have to sit and manage or deploy a team which will manage these servers for us but the being serverless helps us in you know scaling automatically mm -hmm. a uh, very uh, uh, one more question which was just lingering on my mind just related to it covid pandemic is still on okay and uh, the last two years have been very challenging if we consider that part then uh, what evolution bharat pe has seen in terms of what we are talking about right now see in in terms of evolution that we have seen at uh, you know in general bharat pe is that during the last two years the digitization has increased right mm -hmm. and it has increased many fold uh, the way people are consuming content content the way people are making payments the way people are interacting and the amount has increased so the with the digitization what has come is the volume and the scale of payment that has increased it has become many fold in the last couple of years right. and that's where the you know the the smart analytics or the, the scalable platform has helped us you know in scaling and managing the requirements with the increasing scale in the last two years and uh, being serverless or being able to manage it with a lean team and letting the platform do the main job has helped us in actually analyzing and growing further in right. you know in this digitization uh, growth right uh, rahu the same question goes to you as well first of all uh, we'll talk about how big query is serverless service how is it helping and second the covid 19 pandemic the evolution part got it so um, i think the serverless aspect right it, it does come up see every service somewhere runs in some data center mm -hmm. let let's let's be you know uh, uh, cognizant of that fact but at the same time just to add to what sunil said serverless means that you are just able to think about your application your code and you start working you don't worry about any kind of infrastructure management so for example if you see the bigquery architecture which i was talking about in in one of the slides mm -hmm. the compute is completely independent which is dremel right and the storage is completely independent which is colossus and it's sitting on a you know a, a specific columnar format which we call capacitor now you can continue to store terabytes and petabytes of data right uh, into bigquery but you will only incur a storage cost and not incur any querying cost if you don't query it all together mm. right now that's the place where two separation happens between uh, you know your storage and your compute and how they are independently managed mm. and i think that's that's what i would say is a true essence of you know uh, having something as a true to trust serverless service so that's what i would say a uh, bigquery uh, is really really great at uh, you can you can really scale to you know thousands and thousands of slots uh, within uh, within few seconds there is no uh, quote and quote cold start if i may say to uh, to scale um then then on the second topic which you mentioned a uh, pandemic i think see um uh, pandemic has hit us all uh, right um at the same time it has also driven lot of technology adoption right so i mean i know i i mean i have friends i have colleagues um, and and very dear and dear ones to me who were you know not really i mean who used to uh, 
who really didn't had much digital presence if i may call it right i don't even right. want to relate it to data analytics or or big data right uh, it's just that they they really didn't had any uh, digital presence uh, when all of this pandemic hit right we have, we together started to set up that okay how do we operate remotely right how do we get any service without reaching a particular uh, you know physical location right. now when this happened it digitized world so i think it was the first digitization uh which which is good but at the same time i um i do recall it has it has really hurt all of us a lot and and we all know that um and at the same time this also ended up generating a lot of data mm. which which i think is quite evident to what uh, sunil said right so it's um you know it, it's just like going hand in hand but that's what uh, would be my take there uh yeah while we try to get spriti back i i do um have a bunch of questions which i was able to see um so there maybe this is uh, for both of us how yeah. do you suggest to manage ai explainability over big data um you want to take a stab sure why not uh, interesting question uh, you know that how do we explain the ai it is required i think the explainability explainability part of ai in general is required uh, at the business level Uh, at the same time you know for some of the processes it is required for the regulatory processes as well and uh, you know being big data or not but yes any model because with the data the scale that we have these days uh, and the techniques that or the algorithms that we deploy we are becoming more and more accurate uh, but at the same time you know we are uh, the algorithms are becoming complex and the explainability is going in the other direction of accuracy uh, but at the same time you know uh, it the explainability is easier when you have when you are using models like tree based models or regression logistic regression etc but once you go into the realm of neural networks and go into the reinforcement based learning i think that's where the explainability becomes difficult but in the with the recent developments of some of the explainability modules of let's say of tensorflow and the other techniques uh, i think uh, we are able to provide a good explanation why a particular decision has been taken specifically when it is being taken for you know risk or for other decisions uh, what do you think uh, about explainability of ai yeah i think um this is a really interesting topic and yeah. also been a pain area for a while right you talked about tensorflow um so lot of things right we we as google continue to contribute to tensorflow if you will look at uh, some of our services so for example vortex ai i talked about very briefly we also talked about the machine learning capabilities which are in bigquery right both of these with a you know they provide you certain levers to do global as well as local explanation yeah so so for example if you are looking for a feature set of 100 columns which is in bq right and you have built a machine learning model could be regression or classifier or any recommender anything right you can get the attribute level weightage in terms of if you either it's a global level or if you specifically issue a particular predict request right you will be able to get as to what exactly is the feature weightage and based on that weightage you can figure out that okay hey probably out of 100 only 20 fields are contributing to the majority of the weight so let me get rid of the remaining fields in my model and make my model lighter smarter yeah. right on the tensorflow side uh, you you're very right when you said um, specifically around it becomes uh, vision explainability becomes difficult uh, most of the time so uh, if you look at the vertex ai auto ml vision uh, and i know uh, you know sunil we are uh, as we speak we were experimenting with those things um, so uh, with auto ml vision you will be able to get a pixel level okay. uh, explainability as to um, how what exactly led a particular image to be classified as like let's say if you have a dog and a cat right what mm -hmm. are the features at a pixel level which were relevant uh, to the ai to classify them so those kind of things uh, are built in and i think we'll will continue to improve them but but yeah um, i think the question was uh, quite relevant here yeah sorry please i guess uh, smriti is back uh, ah hey smriti yeah hi gentlemen i'm so sorry uh, because of this some issue some technical issue on my part so i lost the connection so no uh, exactly no i was uh, i was hearing you out uh both of you so i think it was very well managed till the time i was in there so uh, this indeed is very interesting what we have delved into so uh, the other aspect uh, when i left the chat was we were discussing raghu was explaining the covid 19 pandemic and how uh, these uh, 
have played the technology basically the data sciences have played a very relevant part so i would really like you to elaborate further on that so that we can continue our discussion thank you so much sunni for handling my path so well <laughs> yeah so so uh, smriti i think we uh, we finished on on that topic post mm. you were left uh, post you left us right so but but essentially like what what i was uh, reiterating earlier as well is that you know this whole pandemic had two aspects right number mm. one uh, it made us digitize a lot right mm. lot of people who were lot of organizations who were who were an, an, and leave apart organization even end mm. users right mm. you eventually started to use more online services mm. and as that continue to happen right there was a lot of data also which is being generated right? right so so there was there was lot of turmoil which has happened it has impacted us uh, in you know in uh, most of us in a very very bad way over right. the last two years but at the same time it has also forced uh, a drive towards digitalization uh, towards a huge amount of data generation and also towards personalization if i may call it right because if you go to a store right or if you uh, if you go somewhere you get that personal feel right how mm. do you simulate that personalization when you're online right. right so i think those are some of the areas where uh, data data science uh, have played a uh, played a lot of very, role very I, I impactful think. absolutely yeah. absolutely and ragu uh, what are the some uh, key priorities which uh, google data cloud is working towards the key priorities right. right see there there will be uh, definitely if i go into the low level of details there will be lot of priorities but if i want to sum it up in just one or two sentences right, right. it's simplification and integration hmm. right uh, if you see you know there's lot of time which is wasted hmm. uh, when you are trying to you know build those complex data pipelines when you are trying to do machine learning when you are trying to you know uh, build models which require lot of iterations and then you know maintenance in the production right so what we are trying to do is like through this complete data cloud we are trying to bring together services in as coherent manner as we can right mm. so like you saw right within uh, within the uh, bigquery system itself you can now run go ahead and run spark code mm. right uh, if you have a machine learning model which is in bigquery and then you have a machine learning model which is in vertex ai mm. both of them can be modeled and version controlled from what xi model registry right? right there are you know there are feature stores there are uh, serverless ways and mechanisms mm. in which we are trying to uh, mm. simplify you know whether it's a data life cycle or it's a machine learning life cycle mm. or it's mm. you know the complete data plus ml so i think you know simplification and integration is i would say our top key priorities and you'll you'll hear keep hearing you know in absolutely. various summits going forward. absolutely this is very simply and very perfectly put uh, one more very interesting uh, questions which question which i have is to you only first of all i uh, this question is for you only ragu how are you preparing to implement gdpr like guidelines on real time data cycle okay okay got it good good question so um see when we talk about uh, gdpr right lot of things come into the come into the picture we we start to think about that okay if i delete the data is it deleted mm. Mm. uh if i um if i don't want to allow access to certain pii data mm. can i control it can i mask it can i encrypt it uh, mm. you know so that no one sees this sees right. it right and right. before i can even do all of this i need to figure out what to encrypt or or do i have a uh, i would say blueprint Mm. of what kind of data is existing across you know mm. uh, big query let's say or, or i mean my lake house let me mm. call it that way mm. right so uh, from a google cloud uh, standpoint we have really come a long way we continue to invest in that uh, mm. at the same time you will i mean i would specifically like to call out uh, one important service which is uh, which is integrated with cloud data catalog mm. Mm. Uh, we call it cloud dlp data loss prevention Right. right so right. very recently uh, we introduced automatic dlp for uh, you know uh, big query right mm. so for example earlier you could um, actually schedule so there are like more than 150 uh, de identification mm. templates like aadhar card pan card you can create your own templates to de identify mm. data there is a column level encryption and decryption which is now available mm. in bq there is automatic mm. dlp which will ensure that you you know at any point in time how much data where it is residing what is its risk profile um so you know all of these services are you know essentially baked in into the platform and uh, they are mm. they work near real time so i think mm. that will be a good way to 
uh, think through about most of these compliances. And you know, GDPR is one. There are more compliances. Uh, right. You know, maybe in the healthcare data, which we also are trying to address. Uh, one more query, which uh, is there, Sunil, which I personally also wanted wanted to understand that uh, uh, Raghu just spoke about the risk factor, which we are required uh, to uh, to explore, to understand, and various facets are related to it, linked to it. And uh, if we talk about the limitation part, first of all, I want to understand what is the limitation per se in the entire process and safeguard. How do we safeguard these entire big data thing, the the, the, the entire uh, this data theory, how do we safeguard it? In terms of limitation and specifically keeping the data privacy and the data security hmm. at the center, right? You have to design and, and it, it doesn't only you know affect the data ecosystem of the organization, hmm. right? It doesn't only impact the data platform or the people who are querying the data or right. the models who are consuming the data to do some prediction, but it also impacts the applications which are generating this data, right? Because the change or the because of the limitation that, that we have to take care of this, or the, how we are capturing it, how that is brought in to the data platform and how that is getting stored. So the encryption address, encryption flight, and how the two systems are communicating to each other mm. is very important. And that we have to take care of it at the time of the application design and the system design itself. As Raghu was talking about that, okay, we can implement DLP, which encrypts the data at the time of, you know, when the data brings is brought into the platform and store it at in an encrypted form. Mm. At the same time, you also implement changes where we have a PII policy where you cannot query a personal data of a user. So mm -hmm. this helps in securing the data, but at times it makes it difficult for mm -hmm. us to consume some of this data for analysis as mm -hmm. well, right? Uh, but the privacy and security always come first come before first. that. True. So True. how to consume it, how to consume it in a mm -hmm. proper way in the mm -hmm. organization and how to build systems around it so, mm -hmm. so that no humans have access to it. Hmm. But at the same time, the systems can access this data and make decisions, or if this can be displayed as a single record to some user, but only through systems, by, but not by humans. So that's where we keep that at the center. In terms of security, security is of utmost importance. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. This is user's data, this is organization's data, and that can be controlled through data-based access. You know, mm -hmm. there is a security which is at the network level, which protects not only the data, but the whole application right. itself. Uh, but in terms of specifically who accesses the data, what data can be, you know, can be exposed, cannot be, uh, that should be managed through a role-based access, whether you are querying this data on an explore platform or mm -hmm. the, the role-based access should, you know, reflect in your query in your visualization system as Raghu was right. talking about earlier in the looker right or as let's say in the tableau reports etc so all the tools that you are using to consume data should have the role-based access implemented and mm -hmm. this role-based access should be controlled at a central place mm -hmm. so for that in one place you can manage access of data in multiple systems and that governs who can access what mm -hmm. type of data and what access can be given so I think that's right. how we manage the security and the data privacy aspect at our end. I think this has been very well explained, Sunil. One more very interesting question I have for you, Raghu, which says that with data cloud, I have options for Vertex AI, BQML, AutoML for machine learning. How okay. to decide uh -huh. what to use and when? Okay. I... Uh... Yeah, this was this was a really short conversation, so we we couldn't go, get into all those details. Mm -hmm. um, see, there are um, there are three things, right? So, Auto ML Suite, uh, which is having you know your uh, uh, no code, low code platform for any kind of uh, vision use cases, video use cases, translation, text, and so on, right? So that's that's one part. Uh, Auto ML itself is part of Vertex AI, right? Mm -hmm. So so just just to group it. Um, AutoML, Vertex AI essentially, you know, come, come together. Uh, BQML is part of BigQuery machine learning, right? In embedded, uh, you know, machine learning, which is present in data warehouse. Um, as a general guidance and, and see, please do take it as a general guidance because um, in my conversations with customers, there have been preferences. Mm. Uh, so one option would be that, okay, if you're building a warehouse, if you're building a lake house uh, in BigQuery um, and you're, uh, you know, you're, you have a, a SQL-based skill set, 
right? Where you can, your uh, analysts can work with SQL, right? And they have a basic understanding of machine learning. I think you should have started with BigQuery ML, right? It has more than dozen models, classifiers, regressors, recommender, recommenders. You can do hyperparameter tuning. So anyone, right? Any any analysts can pick up some basic data science skills and get started, mm-hmm. right? And and they don't really need to be uh, you know a champion in in PyTorch, TensorFlow, and and you know all these libraries and how to use Jupyter Lab and right. Mm-hmm. So that is one thing which I would say as a starting point. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a second step, let's say. The models which are available out there, you know, the dozens of models which are available out there, if, if that doesn't suit your requirement, uh, mm. right, you want to do something more, try mm. AutoML, right? You may have certain vision use cases, right? I, I want to identify, let's say, manufacturing a certain type of truck, which is going. Mm. I want to identify a certain type of gas cylinder, right? I want to identify certain damages, Mm -hmm. Uh, which are happening on the manufacturing line or or, and so on and so forth, right? So vision use cases, video use cases, um, uh, text translation use cases, entity extraction use cases, right? A lot of these you can do with AutoML. And Mm -hmm. the good part is that with AutoML, you will be able to bring in your data, label them, and then just run the complete cycle and eventually get a, you know, HTTP endpoint from which you can query your models for online inference. Mm -hmm. Um, And only when you get to a state that, okay, either you have some custom dependencies, mm. uh, which, and you may already be building something, right? You may already be doing something. You're trying to lift and shift. You're trying to migrate to, uh, you know, uh, Google Cloud, for example, or let's say um, you you really want a very low level control, right? Mm. You have uh, certain data scientists who, who want that low level control, hand tuning of all those models. Uh, that's the place where I would say you start using the custom workflow, uh, Mm -hmm. custom MLOps workflow, which is available in Vertex AI. So, you know, three steps. Uh, You go with BQML, you get to the auto ML, and then you get to the custom uh, model building in Vertex AI. I think that will be a good general guidance. I think uh, you have very successfully explained what the question wanted from you. Thank you so much, Sunil. Thank you so much, Raghu. You have been exemplary today. The way you have uh, got uh, given answers to all those queries. I think uh, we had a very successful session uh, today. And with that, we have come to the end of this particular session on reimagining tech in 2022 presented by Google Cloud and ETCIO. Thank you once again to our speakers, Mr. Sunil Sen- and Mr. Raghu Dubey for your time and the knowledge you shared with us here today. And thank you to our audience for being so patient and interactive. Take care and stay safe. Thank you, Smriti. Thanks, Smriti. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much.